Hello, YouTube world. My name is Craig Kissick, and I'm the Vice President of Nature and Science for Heritage Auctions. And today we have a very special guest, my friend and the consigner of the single owner collection that we're presenting Saturday at auction and up now live on HA.com, is Jeff Knocken, star of the Meteorite Men TV show and meteorite enthusiast extraordinaire. So what I'd like to do is introduce Jeff and kind of have him tell us all why he decided to bring the second part of his collection to auction and what great treasures you're gonna be able to, to find as you participate in this great event with us. Let's go, Jeff. Okay, why, thank you very much, Craig, for that, for that nice intro. Well, the, the reason I wanted to do the auction part two uh, is because of you, so that we could hang out and Appreciate talk meteorites. Yeah, and, there we go. And, and, and have stellar adventures. Yes. Well, let me say, uh, please, that my, my friend and colleague, Craig is a vice president here at Heritage Auctions. He is the director of the Nature and Science Department. He is also a past president of the Association of Applied Paleontological Sciences, <laughs> which is an organization that I love and have been a professional member for over 25 years. It promotes ethical collecting and commerce in the fossil world and supports important paleontology scholarships. So yeah. one of the reasons we get along so well is this is not auctioneer seller. These are friends, you've got two friends and colleagues here interested Absolutely. in the same things, <laughs> interested in meteorites and paleontology and the world that goes with that. So what was your question? Why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> Why is there a part two, Jeff? We had, we had a very there? successful first part of your auction a year ago we did. and we decided to do it again. I mean, we won't tell everybody it's because we had so much fun, but there are other reasons too. There's part one. This has turned into a bit of a collector's item, hasn't I, it? I hope so. It's a beautiful the, catalog. The, the print catalog from part one. Uh, if you don't have one, I can't get you one. <laughs> Sorry, they were, they, like meteorites, uh, had, a, had a, a brief, exciting, and fiery journey through the Earth's <laughs> atmosphere, and have now landed in collections around the world where I, I gather they are staying. Absolutely. The initial idea behind the auction project was I have been deeply involved in the meteorite world for 30 years as my, as my, my primary full-time occupation, but I've been fascinated by meteorites since I was a little boy and traveled to museum collections and started metal detecting when I was about <laughs> 10, or read every astronomy book I could get my hands on. There was very little literature about meteorites when I was a kid some scientific papers, very difficult to get hold of. There was no meteorite collecting community. There was no magazine. Of course, it was long before the internet. So I didn't know a single other person who was obsessed with meteorites as I was. And I, I devoted <laughs> wow. decades of my life to, to traveling and searching for them. I had the great good fortune to meet Steve Arnold, the mighty Steve Arnold in my 30s. He was the first person I met who shared my, what's the word? drive, passion, illness, mania, that's yeah. the word I'm looking mania. for, who shared meteorite mania with me. And I've, I've found meteorites on six continents. I've traveled way over a million miles in search of them and to some unspeakable places, Sahara, Siberia, Australian outback. I shouldn't say unspeakable, yeah. unspeakably inhospitable bleak or challenging <laughs> or super spectacular, particularly the Australian Outback was gorgeous. And so I have amassed a collection. I founded a company, Aerolite Meteorites. We buy, sell, trade meteorites, work with university collections and museums around the world. We're a commercial enterprise. And Aerolite grew out of my love of doing this. I discovered really early on that expeditions are very expensive. If you go, well, I want to I get, get together with Steve and get some new metal detectors and fly to Santiago in Chile in South America <laughs> and rent a couple of vehicles and spend a few weeks searching for, for space rocks in the Atacama Desert and camp and stay in funny little towns and get supplies and try and find a place that has gas in the middle of the Atacama Desert. That stuff's <laughs> expensive. You better think that through if you're going to, if you're going to do that. And I've learned the hard way to do extra thinking through of expeditions before going. So Aerolite grew out of that. It was 
first a hobby business. Oh, let's do a bit of buying and selling in meteorites and sure. raise a few dollars for expeditions. And then it grew into an international thing. And then there were employees and there were gem shows. And all through this process, I'm finding meteorites myself. I'm buying from other people. I'm trading. My friends would come over from China or Russia or Australia and go, oh, Jeff, look what we found. And I go, oh, look what we found this year. So in our, in our field, there's a lot of trading between peers, like comic books or baseball cards. Oh, I've got, I've got two Henbury meteorites from Australia, but I don't have any Brenham palisite from Kansas. Let's trade or swap, as my friend go. Hank says, which go. I like. He goes, yeah, from uh, my friend Hank from Melbourne. Yeah, let's, all right, mate, let's swap some meteorites. <laughs> so all of this has been going on for decades. And throughout it, because at the back, Back here in my spine, there is a collector gene that lives there. And like one of those dark Star Trek episodes, <laughs> controls all my motions and goes, Jeff, you must take that one and put it aside. And you will keep this one in your private collection out of the hundred I might have seen that day. That's the birth of it. That's how, that's how it evolved. Found some, bought some, traded some, few were given as gifts. And after many years of doing this, looking at the size of my collection, I felt like I've been so fortunate to have been the custodian of these beautiful pieces, not just visually beautiful, beautiful but many of them are uh, scientifically important or historically important. Perhaps they, they came from a noted collection, once, once belonged to a major museum collection, uh, which by the way, <laughs> when you see pieces with museum, labels and collections, we did an official trade with the museum. Often museums don't have much of an acquisitions budget to buy new specimens for cash. And so we make a new find, a new type of meteorite, a new type of palisite. We'll trade sometimes. We'll say, well, I'll take off a slice for your museum collection. What do you have duplicates of? And so that's how most of the museum specimens in the auction got here. I didn't want you to think it was anything iffy. Why aren't they still in the museum? It was all, it was all done uh, with, the, with the blessing and the thanks of the museum. They, they may have 50 examples of a particular meteorite and they're stored in the basement in drawers. And I'll, I'll go, yeah, just give me one of those duplicates and I'll give you a piece of this wonderful new thing. So at the end of the day, there's this enormous collection. It needs to be curated. Some some pieces like to have a, a very dry atmosphere. Some pieces like to be out on a stand in the sun. You don't want to get dust on them. A few pieces like this gorgeous Campo del Cielo iron, which is lot 72050. This isn't the biggest piece in the auction, but this is definitely one of the best. A piece like this would want a little bit of attention a couple of times <laughs> a year. They love machine oil, a little bit of machine oil, like you're oiling your bicycle chain gloves, soft cloth. So meteorites do best when they're cared for. And I wanted to not be the only person caring for them. Not, not because of a, a lack of love or fascination for the pieces, but because I think that they just deserve more. I've had decades of delight from this collection and I wanted them to go back out into the world and delight other collectors while I'm still reasonably mentally cognizant <laughs> and can, can oversee the project. And we picked multiple charities, kids' charities, wildlife charities, educational science nonprofits, including the AAPS, yep. of which Craig is a past president and current board member. And a, a significant portion of the funds from both auctions go to those charities. I donate to those charities out of the funds that, that I care about. So everybody wins. And I have to just be honest, it's just really fun. <laughs> it's fun to be at Heritage. It's fun to work with you and Jenny and, and the rest Excellent. of the team. Really, really take it seriously. So somehow this little English boy who grew into a fanatical collector, wasn't just meteorites, fossils, comic books, guitars, literature, movie stuff, crazy collector, can't explain it have been able, has been able to let go of most, not all of it. There are a few pieces, a very few favorite pieces I had to keep, but the bulk of it 
has, has come to Heritage for the auction. And for the second one, don't think these are the leftovers. These are not the, no. <laughs> these are not the leftover pieces from the first auction. If anything, these are the pieces where I went, whoa, I don't think I'm ready to part with that yet, yeah, if ever, oh, I'll, keep, I'll put that one aside. And so when, after the first auction, June last year, was, was so successful, I think generated a lot of interest in the catalogue, a lot of joy among collectors, significant funds for some really good charities. Now we said, okay, it worked really well, let's do it again. We'll put all the, we'll put all the hidden away, I couldn't decide about those pieces into the second one. So there are a lot of really special pieces well, in Jeff, this one. Well, Jeff, you asked me a long time ago, what did I find so fascinating about this project? And I couldn't really settle on one thing, but I told you that the first piece in the book is an iron meteorite that looks like an animal. And the last piece in the book is a Lego sculpture. Okay, so in anything and everything in between. So obviously the, the irons, the palisites, the stones, the, the core varieties of meteorites that everybody talks about are in there. But in terms of layers, there are incredible pieces of unique historical value, rarity. There's a lot of things that actually aren't meteorite specimens. Do you want to share with us a little bit about just how comprehensive this little offering really is? Oh, I love that, Craig. I laughed so hard. When you, the day you said that, well, Jeff's auction starts with an iron meteorite that looks like an animal and closes with a Lego sculpture of the meteorite men. So you know it's going to be in between that. I laughed so hard about that. I felt like, well, that's the bookends of my life. A, a, a rock from space that, that looks like a, a lion and a, a sculpture of my hunting partner and me made out of Lego by the famous <laughs> Lego artist Dave Shaddix. That's that, those are the bookends, and then you try and guess what's what's in between. But yes, you're you're so right, Craig. From day one, which was many actually quite a few years ago, when we started talking about this project, we were both on the same page. Yeah. We both said, let's not just make it a, a load of rocks. Let's let's have interesting meteorites, diverse meteorites, particularly pieces that have a story. Whether it's my story in finding them, or the story of one of or more collectors who had it before me. And then there's all the historic me material that goes alongside. And I would say one of the real standouts in, in the whole collection is lot 72119, which is the collection of letters between the great Harvey Nininger and Captain Drager. Nininger was, we, he's adored in our field. H.H., as he's called, Harvey Harlow Nininger, is referred to by most of us lovingly as the godfather of meteorites. He was a biology teacher in a small town in Kansas in the 1920s, in the 1920s saw a fireball, decided he was going to try and track that, and ended up devoting his life to meteorites. And, and his accomplishments are too much to fill a book. <laughs> he wrote a wonderful, a wonderful autobiography called Find a Falling Star, which is actually truncated. The publisher didn't release the entire manuscript. There was, there's a, there was so much in it. And then his collected papers, which is one of the lots in the auction, uh, that's, uh, we've got it right here, 72122, all of his collected papers on biology and meteorites. And that's accompanied by some handwritten Nininger notes that I, I got from his collection. They're not notes about the book. They're just handwritten notes about specimens that he collected. So anyway, he is a giant in the field. He was a, he was a doer. He was a thinker. He was, he was an innovator. He was there at the beginning. He did really important work at Meteor Crater in Arizona, at the, at the Brenham site in Kansas, and so many other locations around the country, and even the world went to the, went to the Philippines and recovered tectites. We have a, a beautiful collection of tectites that he recovered all with hand-painted numbers as one of the lots in this auction as well. So any meteorites or tectite or collectible that has a Nininger number on it is ultra desirable to collectors. And it's partly because you know that it's the real thing. You know that it comes from the Nininger collection. It's an important piece. It's an historic piece, an early piece. But really, isn't it because of the moments of time travel that you have when you hold that and you go, well, Harvey 
painted this number here in the 60s, or his wife, Addie, painted a lot of them too. They worked and traveled together. He painted this number on this piece. He thought it was important enough to catalog, and that number traveled with it through various collections, went from Nineingers Collection to the Center for Meteorite Studies at ASU, and then I acquired it from them in a trade, and now it's here in Heritage. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful journey. Well, starting in the Philippines first, and even before that, an asteroid, enormous <laughs> asteroid landing in the Philippines and melting millions of tons of target rock to form the tectites. What a journey it's been on. And to me, somehow the number encapsulates that. It says, this is the piece. This is the historic piece that was found on that day. And here's its number. And we're talking about lot 72060, the Harvey Nininger Tectite Collection, four tectites. Also, again, with some beautiful handwritten cards. And these cards came with the tectites. So when Harvey and Addy were in the Philippines in the 60s, he wrote notes about what was in each box. And those are the originals that came with the tectites. So that, to me, that's a wonderful glimpse into the history of Meteorites, well, not even a glimpse. It's like a good stare, a solid stare into the history of meteorites. Well, Jeff, you know what's so funny is you just, some of the first things that you highlighted weren't even meteorites. Right. You know, we just talked about that and that's what you kind of did here. Now, clearly the, the, the gentleman we referenced, the, in addition, Oscar Monig, Albert King, these people were your heroes, it seems yeah. like, at least on an intellectual level. So what, what, how did they influence you or what does it mean to you? Clearly the historical aspect of your collection is very important. And we tried to highlight that through that. I mean, we, we wanted to have fun, but we also wanted to write a book that has scientific value to people and that really tells the backstory, not just the story. It's like Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. Here we are, we want to tell the backstory and everything and have fun with the zoo and everything else. So, I mean, again, it's just, it's phenomenal to me how comprehensive this is so what do you want to say about the people who came before you that that put a young Jeff Notkin on the path to become the Jeff Notkin of today and we're trying to touch that mind out there to maybe be a future generation of someone who's an enthusiast of meteorites I love it that you included all of this and we're particularly referring I guess to this spread in the catalog which has biographical portraits of Harvey Neininger who we already mentioned. Maybe we'll get back to the letters. We started <laughs> talking like. about the letters and got distracted by the million interesting things that are here. And the great Oscar Monig and the great Dr. Albert King. Oscar was a successful businessman in Fort Worth, Texas. His family owned department stores. He, he didn't have any kids. He was very enthusiastic about astronomy when he was a young man. And he became fascinated with meteorites. And I, I, I wrote a note here, like his friendly rival, H.H. H. Neininger, because they knew each other and they would compete with each other. They would race when there was a witness fall to get to the site. And they had their own men out in the field as well. Some, some I think, fairly rough, hard living digger, <laughs> excavator guys, probably in old beaten up pickup trucks who were, who were ready to go. And in the, in the Monig archives, uh, at TCU in Fort Worth, which is really worth looking at if you ever have the time. There's some telegrams in code from Oscar, from, from Oscar Monig's man in the field. It's very James Bond, <laughs> like have located two examples of the object, uh, understands that X is in the vicinity, which is no doubt Neininger or Neininger's man. So they're racing to try and find these, these meteorites. So I wrote, he was very successful in commerce, but meteorites were his great passion. And like his friendly rival, H.H. H. Neininger, Monig set out across the vastness of Texas to find them. And he didn't really know anything about meteorites. He taught himself. He was, a, he was an a enthusiastic astronomer. He loved poetry. And he just was going to learn. So he built one of probably the biggest collection of Texas meteorites ever assembled by going around to farms and talking to people, taking a rock, going to these giant farms. And you know what those big farms are like out in West Texas. <laughs> yes, we do. There are thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of acres, enormous places. And sometimes people who have big ranches out in the boonies, they don't really want anybody just showing up asking questions. So he must have been very charming. And he would show examples of meteorites and he would explain 
their characteristics. They usually stick to a magnet. And he said, if you ever find any of these on your property, I will buy all of them. And he did, and he, he, he kept to his word. And that's why there were multiple examples of certain, certain types of meteorites in the Monod collection. And in later years, in his later life, he donated it to TCU in Fort Worth. And my very great friend, the late Dr. Art Elman, who was an eminent geologist, became the curator of that department. And Art set out to take the Texas collection and turn it into an international collection. And so he traded duplicates of Oscar Monic specimens to museums around the world for, for other pieces. And of special note, talking about this, 72087 is a Dimmit meteorite from Dimmit, Texas. And everything about this meteorite is Texas. It's big, <laughs> it's got that, that red dirt, that red dirt color from out in, in the flat areas of West Texas. And, and it's got a mystery too. So it has two numbers painted on it, hand painted. And one of them is M138.12, the small number. That's the official catalog number for this meteorite. That says that it belongs in the Monic collection. Number 138 means Dimmit. That's the code number for Dimmit. And 12 means it was the 12th example of Dimmit that was cataloged. So we know there were at least 11 other Dimmits. The 12D underneath it is really something. That was painted by Oscar himself. And Art Elman, who was my very good friend, was Oscar's very good friend. And Art told me that Oscar told him that's a code number. <laughs> and that, says, that tells where the meteorite was found. We've never been able to decipher it fully, but we believe the number is the section and the D is the initial of the ranch owner. So. There, and there are several that have those numbers. This is the only one in the auction. They're extremely rare. I've only had two in my whole career. But that's just a lovely piece of meteorite history. Well, and again, the bonus that, you know, the, the cataloging is important. There's so much science behind meteorites, although I think sometimes in, in an incredulous way, you just have to think about where these things started and ended up, and that's, that's enough. You almost don't have to go past that. But again, so many of these meteorites come with historical labels. So many of these come with an incredible story. So many of these are extremely singular, not because of the object itself, but because of the story of how it came to be in your collection. I think that's also another really interesting angle that we have on this. And I know that labels are very important to you, in fact, you, you designed an entire grouping of labels for this particular offering. So how important do you think it is to have these pieces properly curated? I mean, a meteorite of its own is beautifully aesthetic, but there's, there's more to be told. It's extremely, it's extremely important. I think it's one of the most important things there is. And there are a couple of ways to look at it. If you had, say, if, say this was the only meteorite in my collection. This is a gold basin that was found by the great Jim Creek, the discoverer of the gold basin field. And this, this is one of the lots in the auction too. If you just had one meteorite or one fossil, right. you'd always go, well, yeah, that's that meteorite from gold basin or I found it or my friend found it. But then over the years, you have more pieces and now maybe you have 10 or maybe you have 100. And because of the failings of the human brain, we begin to forget all the details. So it's very good to have a card next to it that says, this is a gold basin, this was found by Jim Cree, uh, it's circa 1999, I acquired it on such and such a date, and you keep that card with the collection, and it looks nice in your cabinet, it makes your whole thing look a little bit more official. That's the small part. The big part is, this meteorite, this gold basin, and the other ones that have labels, all being well, they're going to be here long after we are. And what happens after you've passed away or a hundred years have gone by? Maybe your collection's been dispersed into numerous different things or perhaps it was donated to a museum. If those pieces don't have numbers painted on them and or cards attached to them, I promise you without a shadow of doubt, over time, many of them will become lost or mislabeled. And I know this because I have time and again been called in to look at a collection, the owners passed away, there weren't any labels, or in, in a kind of a more frustrating instances, this has happened to me a few times, all the labels, all the identification cards were put in a little box, <laughs> and all of the meteorites were put in a big box. 
and it was extremely difficult to match them up. It really takes an expert to do that. And in some cases, I still have some of them. There were a few we were never able to identify. We knew they were meteorites. And the owners would go, well, uh, I'll just let you keep those few mystery ones for your trouble. And I, I, have, a, I, have, a, I have a little mini collection of those mystery rocks. Wow. So, so the, the information stays with the meteorite. It reminds you of the story attached. And then when you're not around anymore to remember, it allows the next generation and the generation after that to remember. Isn't it quite marvelous, really, that you could look at a rock and go, gosh, this was, this was found in the 1800s by, by an eminent scientist, or this was found by Neininger in the 1930s. How wonderful. You almost touch their life and work sure. through that. So there's a, there's, a, there's a cosmic, almost emotional connection and there's a hard science reason for doing it as well. So a researcher could go, gosh, this gold basin was found in 1999. Uh, I'm going to use today's modern tech to further examine it. And to properly answer your question, <laughs> yes, I made my own knock-in collection cards. I had no help in this. I made every one of them myself by hand, wrote the number in blue ink in the hope that those cards would always remain attached, stay with that piece, partly so that people would always know what the rock was, but partly because I wanted to add my bit to the story. Sure. And, and one day somebody will look back and go, oh, Notkin collection card, I wonder who that guy was, let's look him up. And then they'll probably see some crazy antics on Meteorite Men and go, what a nutcase. Picture of you as a punk rocker. But <laughs> so so let, me, let me segue into something that fascinates me. I mean, arguably, you know, we are here to sell your collection and get it in the hands of people who can treasure it like you did. Now, meteorites are one of those things that fundamentally almost seem priceless to me. If you really think about what was involved in a meteorite ending up here or what this represents in terms of time, space, however you want to look at it, yet a lot of the stuff, especially in this auction, to me seems relatively very reasonably valued. How do, you, how do you look at the true value of meteorites from a financial sense? You're a businessman, you have a company that does this too, but to me it's fascinating that someone can get something like this for a very attainable amount of money. I really wanted these to be affordable to as wide a range of people as possible. And I've been to meteorite auctions, well, I've been to many meteorite auctions, but I've been to some where every piece was a high-end piece. Every piece was in the thousands of dollars. And most pieces had high reserves. And I thought, this is only for very, very wealthy collectors. Even museums can't, in my, most cases. There are a few notable exceptions. Most museums cannot afford, sadly, to go to a meteorite auction and buy the piece they want. And that is tragic, and that's a whole other story. Sometimes there'll be a wonderful example where a wealthy individual will know that a museum wants a piece and will buy it and will donate it, but that doesn't happen every day. So I, I guess I won't go into exactly the pricing details because it's, it's, I suppose, somewhat confidential to the company, but in simple terms, Craig and I sat down and said, well, a very attractive or generous price for this piece would be this. And then we took quite a small <laughs> fraction of that already what we thought low price, like a very small fraction, and said, that's where we'll start it. And there are only about four or five pieces with reserves in the whole 142 lots. And so low, very low starting prices. So whatever it's listed for, that's, that's where it starts. If you're the only person who bids $250, that meteorite's going home with you. It's pretty hard to get a <laughs> a known collection piece for 250 bucks. And uh, the other thing is, particularly in this auction, I selected a lot of very high-end pieces, very high-quality pieces, either because of their aesthetic beauty or their historic significance, or we found them on the show or whatever it was, but they were in that very attractive palm-sized specimen range, making them within the purchase power of most collectors. So I didn't go, I didn't want every piece in the auction to be in the thousands of dollars. I, want, I wanted there to be, yes, there's some, there's a hundred thousand dollar meteorite in the collection that most museums would be thrilled to have that 
that giant Campo del Cielo. That is a world-class meteorite. But there are also lots of pieces like this that were found by my really great friend Jim Cree, who was one of my mentors and took me out into the field and taught me how to find gold basins decades ago. And he's long gone. That's a, that's a piece of meteorite history right there. Absolutely. Well, one thing, Jeff, about that, because we kind of did so aggressively, you know, look at this auction, that uh, one thing that's a little different is any piece that doesn't sell, and I don't think there's going to be many, we're not going to do any post-auction buys oh, for yes. this one. So that's a little bit of a different thing. So, so no one, you know, it's not, it's not a good strategy to wait around and hope something's there. I mean, I, th I think there are certainly deals to be had already, certainly oh, where these things start, although I think the value you know, should be driven by the market and put it up that way. But that that's one thing that's a little different that I wanted to tell our audience. And since we have um, viewers here, do you want to take some questions from the audience? I'd, I'd love to. I just, if I'm so glad sure. you mentioned that. I just, sure. want to, I just want to clarify that a little bit. So those of you who participated in the auction last year will remember there were very few pieces unsold. But the ones that were uns uh, unsold went up on the website, and I think they stayed there for 45 days, and you could still go buy them at the low opening bid or make an offer. We're not doing that. That, that is not happening. So if you think you're going to come back later, oh, let's go see if I can get a good deal on any unsold stuff, forget about it. This is a site-specific performance this coming Saturday. And if there is anything that doesn't sell, it's well, going to disappear. You will not be able to come back and get that later. Well, and this so, is a part two, but there is not going to be a part three. We, no, we have this, exhausted yeah. your meteorite collection yeah. at this point. That's also, so. I'm glad you said that too. <laughs> this, is, this is the biggest meteorite auction I've ever done, and it's also the final meteorite auction of my career. There will never be another knocking collection meteorite auction. We have uh, all the good pieces that are available. We're in part one or part two, and... I really, I don't have enough material to do another one. But this, I, I wanted to go out, I wanted to go out, I wanted my personal collection to go out on a high note. Sure. This has nothing to do with Aerolite Meteorites, which the company is uh, still going strong uh, and will continue so for many years. This is my private collection and it is the last and I think the best pieces. So I don't want to sound too sales pitchy, but I will, <laughs> I will convey something I learned as a meteorite collector, which is if you see something that you really love, a piece, and you really want to have it, don't delay, as I did a couple of times, and go back to the vendor the next day and go, oh, I really want to get that beautiful oriented scotoline with the tiny little scotoline melted onto the back of it. And it was sold, and I went, you idiots, why didn't you just buy that? because good pieces will always go. There is always a collector waiting. Sure. And another piece of really good advice that I was given early on was buy the best piece you can. Don't buy a lot of little scrappy things. Use your purchasing power. Get the one that speaks to you the most. I'd rather have this than 10 little ones, but that's me. I'm a crazy collector. What do I know? Well, speaking of that, that's a perfect segue to the first question I see on the screen. Do you still occasionally hunt for meteorites? Is that directed at you? No, I think that's directed you at sure? you. Yeah. I look like I'm hunting dinosaurs, <coughs> not meteorites, so you get to, you take this one. I certainly do still hunt for meteorites and fossils. I am a paleontology nutcase as well as meteorites. Actually, I, I, I fell in love with fossils even before meteorites and, and growing up in southern England in the chalklands, there were some very good fossil hunting sites. It's another reason we get on so well because of the paleontology <laughs> collection. So I have, uh, I'm not gonna tell you what it is because it's so amazing. I am, I'm gonna keep it secret tech until I've had time to really field test it. But a Meteorite Men fan sent me a lovely letter a while back and he goes, oh Jeff, I really enjoyed your show and all the adventures and I'm a metal detector fanatic and have you ever tried XYZ metal detector, which I'd never heard of. Very unusual design. And he goes, oh, it's too bad because they're really hard to find. Now they don't make it anymore. I think you would. Boy, that's all it takes is for somebody to say, oh, you wish you had this metal detector, but they don't make them anymore. So you won't be able to find one. I found somebody in Florida who had one on Craigslist. And I messaged him and I go, I know it sounds like a scam. So I'm just going to start with that. <laughs> I'm not in Florida, because you Craigslist people all know the thing where it goes, oh yeah, so I want to buy your such and such a thing. Can you ship to, can I have a guy pick it up? No, no, no. So I called him and said, I need to have this detector. Uh, I realize it sounds bizarre, but I'm for real. And 
to all of this and I sent him a couple of photos of me and he wrote back and he goes, yeah, it does sound like a scam, but are you the guy from Meteorite then? <laughs> <laughs> and so it, was, it arrived a few days later. So very excited to try out this new metal detector. I've just I've done a bit of testing in the hills. Uh, that's a bit of a long question. Yes, so I'm, I'm focusing on, on two things. One is marvelous arid wastelands, dry wastelands in the Southwest where there have to be undiscovered meteorites lying on the surface and some sites that I want to go back to with this smoking detector. Whoa. Now stepping back to a more general term, Jose has a question that, that really fits right in here. What type of people collect meteorites and what are they looking for? That's a pretty basic question, but for people who don't understand, you know, you were, you were a finder, you were all these other things, but you are at heart a collector. What is a meteorite collector looking for? I love that question and, and we have, worked with everyone on the collector scale from the, from the most serious, like I must have an example of every type of meteorite. They're called type collectors. From, from the rarest stone to the most common iron, I must have an example of one of everyone in my collection. That's a big collection. To the other end of the scale, maybe a lady will call, almost whispering, and she goes, oh, it's, it's my 30th wedding anniversary with my husband and he loves astronomy and I know he's always wanted a meteorite, but I don't know anything about them. Can you help me pick one for him? And I love that because then I'll say, well, what kind of person is he? What other interests does he have? Do you think he'd like, excuse me, do you think he'd like a big showy piece on his desk or would he like an elegant piece in a, in a little display cabinet? So some people just want one meteorite. Some people want one of every meteorite and then everything in between. We have certain people only collect historic meteorites. They only want ones that have come from museum collections. Some people only collect witnessed falls. I only wanted if it was seen to fall on a particular time and date. And after, you can get even more specific than that. Some people, uh, this is a very expensive hobby, collect meteorites that have hit man-made objects, like the one that hit the Peekskill car in New York in 1994 the Claxton mailbox, various other things. So there, there are all these subgroups. And then if you want to meet some really eccentric people, of which I am also one, I say this with love, impact type collectors. So now we've got a subset of people don't actually collect the meteorites. They collect the material that was made by the meteorite impact. And by that, I mean the beautiful Moldavites, of which we have three glorious ones in the auction. That is an impact glass found in the Czech Republic, but interestingly, formed by the multi-million year old Ries crater in Germany. And that's lots 720646 65 and 66. A gorgeous, luminous, translucent green glass caused when the rock at the point of impact was melted into glass. Can you get your mind behind that? how much heat and pressure is required to turn hard German rock into a beautiful green glass. And Moldavites are very desirable to the spiritual community, people who are interested in crystals and things with healing powers. For the, for the meteorite nut, it's the story sure. to me. That, Absolutely it is. And uh, the lots before that, 7062 and 63, Libyan desert glass, very similar. In this case, the heat released by an ancient meteorite impact in the Libyan desert melted the sand into this yellow glass. And there are several others. I'm particularly fond of the Santa Fe shatter cone, 72068. That's a, that's a big piece. I collected that one myself in New Mexico. And that's the target rock underneath a crater being altered by the sheer force of the impact. Right. The shock of the meteorite hitting the ground went through the rock underneath the point of impact and deformed it. It, it, it makes our, oh, I dropped, uh, I dropped my drink and it shattered. It makes our little our little mishaps seem pretty tiny in comparison. No, Jeff, was it? that was that locality have something to do with being discovered by a dog? Yes, <laughs> it's a, this is why you should pay attention when you're out. And this is another example of amateurs making great story. 
yes. contributions to the scientific world. A, a retired geologist who had, interestingly enough, lived in France near the Rochechouart impact site and was therefore familiar with impact sites, earth rocks that have been altered by meteorite impacts, was walking his dogs near Hyde Park outside of Santa Fe on a windy road <laughs> and there had been an earth slide exposing a big cliff face and he said, gosh, that looks like a shatter cone exposure. And he reached out to a colleague of mine who was Jared, who was a no known impact specialist who reached out <laughs> to another one and some years of research followed and yes, was identified of, one, of the newest of only about 200 confirmed meteorite impact sites on the entire planet. And most of them are ancient. And that one's very ancient. It's so it's, <laughs> the land's been lifted up. So you're now looking at a cross section through the floor of the crater. That's amazing. That's amazing. Did I answer the question or did I get way no, sidetracked? No, I think again? you did. But I think, I think we've got one from David that's really going to, it's going to, these questions are great because they kind of segue off each other. So. David says, if I wanted to start meteorite hunting, where could I go in Texas to start? And are there any surprising pieces that, that, that you've, or you've, or any, any places where you've found meteors that you would be surprised by? Uh, I, well, so two different questions, yep. I, almost three questions, I, I guess. Okay, so uh, excellent set of questions, David. Thanks for that. I, this might sound self-serving, but it's not meant to be. If you want to start meteorite hunting, the first thing I would do is watch Meteorite Men. There are 23 episodes, and my brilliant co-host Steve and I made this show between 2009 and 2012, and it's widely available. You can watch it in glorious HD on Curiosity, Pluto, Spark, also my YouTube channel. And so when we start, when we were developing the show, I had this sleepless, sleepless night one night, and. I called Steve and I go, oh, are you sure we're doing the right thing? When we got into this, it's no how-to book. As Steve's fond of saying, there's no meteorite hunting aisle in your local mega mart, which I thought a brilliant <laughs> quote. Meaning there's no one-stop place you can go to get the equipment and the knowledge to find meteorites. And I said, if we do this show, which is very fact-based and we're by mutual agreement, thank God, with our wonderful production company and Science Channel, we all wanted to do a fact-based science adventure show, not a reality show with, well, you know what I mean. So it was, it was always science first, authenticity. We wanted to find good meteorites, go to exciting places. And so my moment of doubt or panic when I said to Steve, well, are, you sure, are you sure we should do this? Because there's no, there's no putting it back. We can't put the information back once, once we have shared how we do this with the world. And he thought about it for a moment and he goes, well, Jeff, someone's going to do it sooner or later. So it might as well be us because hopefully we'll do it properly. <laughs> so the techniques that we use on the show are absolutely real. Magnets, metal detectors, triangulation, talking to eyewitnesses, all of these things that we do. And then I've also written a book called how to Find Treasure from Space, the Expert Guide to Meteorite Hunting, which is very easily findable. You can get it from Aerolite. You can get it. Please support independent booksellers rather than the obvious. A very easy to find, award-winning book, packed full of photographs, diagrams, information about detectors, all the knowledge that I have in here and in my heart is in that book. And then the, the simple answer is just go out and try. Read the book, watch the show, absorb the information, we go to dry, old surfaces where there's no vegetation. Take a magnet, take a metal detector. Most important thing, familiarize yourself with what meteorites look like. Most meteorites that are found do not look like this. This is an exceptional, beautiful, museum cabinet worthy display piece. Most meteorites that are found look like this. They look like rounded, brown, dark, gold, blackish rocks, and they really stick to a magnet. So there's loads of info out there. If you, if you visit the website, aerolite.org, you can get the book. There's a lot of stuff about meteorite identification. There are loads of videos online. I have, I have, a, I have a series called Space Rock School on my Jeff Notkin YouTube channel that introduces you to the different types of meteorites. So loads and loads of info. 
out there. And and what was the last question about surprising? Was there a surprising Well, I, th I think was there, yeah. Would, I mean, did you find meteors, meteorites somewhere that surprised you to find yeah. them? I mean, you know, I'm sure you did. Well, multiple times, but I'd say the winner is, is a lot in the auction. It's the Park Forest Stone that I found in oh, 2003. Yep, yep. It's lot 72109. And I'd already been adventuring with Steve as my hunting partner for quite a few years. We'd We'd been all over the, all over the states. We'd we'd been down to Chile and many other adventures, but this was our first time hunting in a major city, and it was following the March 2003 fireball that was seen by hundreds or thousands of people over Chicago. And I found that stone, that beautiful fusion crusted stone, sitting in the rain in the parking lot of an attorney's office. <laughs> And hence, I myself take credit for the birth of space law. Thank you very much. Wow. So you don't have to be in the wilds of any place to do it. It does prove that meteorites <laughs> can land absolutely anywhere. And Steve found one on the roof of a, of a large building, got permission to go up on the roof of a big old storage thing or something and found a little meteorite on the roof. That was a first for us. Well, I mean, your excitement here is obviously this belies why you do this. But Anthony has a great question that... He's going to set you up, and I'm glad I don't have to as your friend, because this is the question. I hate when people ask questions like this, too. What's your favorite meteorite, Jeff? Is that my friend Anthony Gill from the UK? <laughs> That's fantastic. Hi, Anthony. Uh, it's really nice to hear from you. Well, Anthony knows, Craig knows, most people who know me know, actually. My favorite meteorite is Sokodaline. This is, this, is this is the king of meteorites. It is the meteorite's meteorite. It has everything you could possibly want from a meteorite. So it is a witnessed fall, mean, meaning it was seen to fall by credible observers. It was the largest recorded meteorite event in modern times, as, as long as we've had records. There's a painting of the fireball that was done by the Russian artist Medvedev, who happened to be sitting on a, in the middle of the snowy mountains in the Skodaline Mountains in February of 1947 when this fireball went over his head, rattling trees. When, when the largest pieces hit the ground, they formed 101 separate craters. But most of all, for whatever reason, Skodaline melted into the most amazing shapes during flights. I'm an arts guy, I, I love sculpture, I like modern art, I like twisted, strange, gnarly things. Giacometti's my favorite sculptor. And when I started seeing Sokotalines coming out of Russia in the 90s, I thought, well, these look like Giacometti sculptures. These are amazing. And this one may be a bit like a Brancusi bird. So I fell hard for Sokotalines and I became friends with all the hunters who worked out there, worked <laughs> the strewn field, a very dangerous site home to venomous snakes, ticks, Siberian tigers. My very good friend, Ivan, who did a lot of hunting out there, was very proud of showing a photograph where he's standing in this, in this thick forest and he's holding a Colt 45 at arm's length and staring right at him is a gigantic Siberian tiger. That's, at, that's the Sakota Lean Fall site. And oh. he goes, don't worry, Jeff, I can not, <laughs> uh, not shoot tiger. I just have, in case he want me for lunch, but I shoot in the air and he is away. It's wow. good because he knows I like cats. It's fantastic. I, like I wouldn't it. shoot a tiger to get a meteorite. Would not do it. <laughs> so like there it. are multiple Sokotalines in the auction. The auction starts with the Sokotaline collection. It starts with my favorite sub-collection of the Sokotaline collection. It's getting a bit meta here, which is the, Sk the Sokotaline Zoo. And when I see these irons that have been melted into these fantastical shapes. During flight, during their brief flight through the air, they're heated to such a temperature that, that they, they transform it into these marvelous zoomorphic shapes. And to me, a lot of them look like animals. And so we have an owl, a lion, a shark, a bunny, a terrier, two <laughs> dragons, and I think you will see what I mean. In large part, the members of what is called the Sukkot Aline Zoo have a natural hole, a small natural hole that melted during flight. And that just can't help but give them a face 
like appearance. Especially the owl. Well, that's and especially the lion. That's true, actually, but also especially all of them. Also, say though that that the, the <laughs> mo more important part to me, I, think, I mean, a hole in a meteorite is already a maybe a one in a thousand occurrence. Yeah. So the fact that a meteorite has a hole is ex inherently rare. Then when we have the zoomorphic qualities, this kind of gets. Uh, we had a lot of fun with this for sure. So. And if you were to, for example, look at seven two zero zero seven, which is is one of, one of the cicodylines from the zoo and I call it the sleeping dragon. This is a beautiful individual. This is one of the pieces that landed on its own. This, this didn't explode into shard-like shrapnel in a crater. This landed as a whole individual, and it's covered by those little indentations called regmaglyphs, showing how it melted in flight. And this one has a natural hole towards the top, would have melted out during flight, a softer inclusion melted out. And when, when it's placed flat on the ground, it just looks like a dragon to me with its eye almost closed, like it's just <laughs> sleeping atop the treasure. That's and awesome. there, there is an oft repeated joke that my long suffering staff at Aerolite <laughs> and uh, my partner, business partner, would sometimes get a little bit exasperated with me and go, Jeff, you know, not every meteorite looks like an animal, come on. And I'd go, no, they do, look, here's a dog, this one's a crocodile, if you hold this one upside down, it's a chimpanzee. <laughs> and I, I won them over, over time. It's, it's true, if you spend enough time, or as was the case on the first expedition that, to, to Chile that Steve and I did, we very short on battery power and we had terrible windstorms every night when we were camping at the Imalac site. So we spent many hours sitting in the tents with one little flashlight holding up these Imalac pieces one at a time going, what does that look like? Oh, I don't know. Wow. Cat, uh, snake, rat, don't know, turn it that way. Oh, it also <laughs> looks like a dog. So we called it the Rorschach meteorite test. And <laughs> <coughs> this is what meteorite hunters do Excellent. to pass the time when they are they're confined to their tents. Well, this is a perfect segue because we have another would-be meteorite hunter. So, oh, good. so Adam is gonna piggyback on David's question and Adam says, hi Jeff, what brand of metal detector would you recommend for a beginner? I, I'm a great fan of, of several metal detector companies. I, I first have to give a shout out to Fisher Labs. Uh, I've been a Fisher metal detector user uh, for decades and they're, they're a, a good American company, make a wide variety of detectors. Uh, also, ditto to Mine Lab, which is a, a very sophisticated, very successful company. We have been fortunate enough to have professional relationships with both companies. So there are, there are always new detectors that are coming out on the market. And part of it is finding one that feels good to you. So consider this. You're not gonna find a meteorite in the first five minutes. Well, I did one time, but in generally speaking, when you get to the field and start searching, you're not gonna find something right away. And if you stay at it, you're gonna be swinging that detector for years. So one of the first tips that I will give you is try to teach yourself to be ambidextrous. And I can swing a detector with both arms, not at the same time, because you get interference. But 10 minutes, swap, 10 minutes, you can hunt for twice as long. So finding one that is a good weight and feel for you is part of it. Another really important thing, you must purchase a detector that finds ferrous materials. Most detectors do now. Most detectors have what's called a discrimination circuit where you can switch it from all metals to precious metals. Some people are out on the beach looking for lost rings and jewelry. Some people are looking for gold nuggets in the washes and hills. Some people, like me, are looking for meteorites. And so you need iron. You need a detector that finds iron to find meteorites. Precious metals is not gonna work for you. So I would recommend visiting one of those great companies, or if you go to airlight.org or meteoritemen.com, we're also licensed resellers for Mine Lab and uh, Fisher. And these companies take their work very seriously. It's not. It's not an easy thing to become an authorized reseller. So see, see what, what looks good to you. You don't need to spend $10,000 on your first detector. There are multiple good entry level detectors that are a few hundred bucks. Just make sure it finds iron. And if you like it and stick with it, 
then go ahead and get one of the higher end ones. And, and do reach out to me privately on social media if you'd like uh, some specific, maybe uh, recommendations of specific model numbers. Yeah, but, but go get one, it's great fun. And you'll find loads of other stuff too, unexpected stuff, coins, bullets, belt buckles, <laughs> horseshoes, weird stuff. Some things still not being able to identify what they are. So then, Jeff, one of one of the you know sort of a, a maybe a novice question would be: so many meteorites are stony; they're not they're not metallic. They're not going to register through a metal detector. What would you recommend to the people like Alan and David, or Adam and David, who want to go hunting for meteorites that are not metallic? Excellent question, Craig. In in the early day, my early days of meteorite hunting, I. I mostly search for irons and palisites for this particular reason because irons are about 93% iron and palisites are about 50% iron and both of them will howl when you put a detector over them. Stone meteorites can be 20% iron or less and it's in little tiny flakes. Like, so this, this gold basin uh, that, we've, that we've mentioned a few times, it's a great show and tell piece for so many reasons. This is an L4 chondrite. That means it's low in iron. It's still heavier than an, an earth rock, the same size would be, but this is 20% or less of little tiny iron flakes, and most detectors won't see that. They're just not ready for it. So Mine Lab makes a fantastic detector, uh, 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 SDC 2300, was originally uh, developed to look for unexploded ordnance, but for the military. So it's a very sensitive detector. It's also an expensive detector. That, that's, it's, a, it's a few thousand dollars. But that is one that finds stone meteorites. So you need a very sensitive detector if you're going to look for stone meteorites. And the thing that I recommend the most, if this is what you want to do, and if you want to go to a known site like Gold Basin or Franconia, where many stone meteorites have been found before, get yourself a stone meteorite first and put it out in your yard away from any other distractions away from nails and bolts and old shotgun shells and listen to what it sounds like. Put the detector over it, do some calibrating. Do I want it to be more sensitive? Do I want it to ignore more material in the ground? If it's when, when ground, when normal ground uh, gives off a signal of, of its own, we, we might describe it as salty. So there's maybe a little bit of iron dust in it. So you, you, you balance the detector, ground balancing it's called to try and negate that. But the, it, the simplest thing is, or the, the best use of time rather I should say, is practice with a known quantity. So if you, if you can get a, an example of the type of meteorite that you would like to find, work with it. I've done this a million times. When I lived in Southern Arizona, the back of my house was called Metal Detector School. This is a true story. I buried all kinds of meteorites back there, and I wasn't really paying attention when I did it, from small ones to big ones, down to several feet. And then I threw sticks all around, and I spun around and clicked my heels a few times, and then probably went inside and had a beer, and then I didn't think about it for weeks. And whenever I got a new detector, I would take it out to metal detector school. I go, okay, how does it perform in the wild? <laughs> It's one thing if there's a rock on your driveway, it's another thing if you buried one in your desert yard somewhere and you can't remember where it is. And when I left that house, sold the house and moved out of Arizona, I went back out there one last time with, uh, with my good Technetix T4 detector. And you know what? I found a Campo del Cielo about this big. <laughs> it was buried nice. in the garden uh, with, with my friend who was hunting with me at the time. I was teaching her how to use the detector and, and her mind was blown. She goes, are all the ones buried out here this big? And I said, no, I think that was the last big one, but we can still check. So I tell you this rather elaborate story as an example of learn by doing. The That's tools are excellent. at your disposal. You can easily get what we call a throw specimen, not this one, but you just get a small stone meteorite and put it on the ground and practice and then bury it an inch and see if you can still find it. Bury it four inches, see if you can still find it. Practice, practice, practice and train your eyes to know what they are looking for. Awesome. Well, Jeff, we've, we've had a great time. I think we have one last question from Brandon. Again, he's setting you up, not me, but it's a perfect question to put you on the spot. What variety of meteorite would you like to own that you've never had an example of in your collection? Oh, wow, what a great question. I've never been asked that question before. Thank you very much for that. 
Well, that's that's a tricky one, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I would say so. Okay, well, uh, so I've always been a, I've always been enamoured of meteorites, that, American meteorites that had really good place names. Unlike in paleontology, where a new discovery is typically named after or by the discoverer. So, example, in the near future, I expect to have, you know, Allosaurus <laughs> Kisiki, Kisikai, when he discovers a new species of Allosaurus. That doesn't happen in meteorites. Meteorites are named after the nearest town or landmark to, the, to, their, to where they fell meaning most are named after post, the post offices in the US. So there are some really great names. Two of my favorite, of which I've never owned, are Crab Orchard, which is from Tennessee, and Four Corners, which is from the Four Corners. And they're both beautiful meteorites. Crab Orchard is a rare mesociderite, of which we have a couple in the auction. So those, there is a couple that I've, I've coveted, but that's strictly for, for the name. It's not a, a type. I think if... If I really had carte blanche and someone said, okay, Jeff, just, just, pick, just pick anything, I would ask if I could have one of the Antarctic meteorites that have been found because they, their, their NSF, National Science Foundation funded expeditions on the American side and all the meteorites found in Antarctica are retained for study, r rightly so, and never make them out into the collector's market. And some of those meteorites have been on earth for many thousands of years and yet they are preserved to such a high degree because they've been frozen in Antarctic ice for thousands of years. So I, I, have, I have meteorites from six other, six other continents, so it would be nice to have one Antarctic meteorite in the collection, but only if it was legal. I'm not suggesting anything improper here. <laughs> well done. Well, we've had a great, great time. Great question. Thank you very much yep. for that. Great we've time. had a great time. Um, thank you for joining us. Don't miss the live auction on Saturday. July 22nd, it starts at noon central time of this, this crazy man's uh, collection. Uh, you can go to our website, ha.com slash notkin, which is N-O-T-K-I-N. To see more, you can view the printed catalog, you can register to bid, and of course you can view the, the lot. So uh, it's open for bidding right now, so jump on and look at all these things that are in the beautiful catalogs. They're online for you with lots of videos of, of Jeff and Jeff and I as well. So thank you for your time today. Have a great weekend and, and good, we good go, hunting. Yeah, good hunting. And before we go, if you're in or near Dallas and would like to come to the live, there is a live floor session of the auction this coming Saturday at noon in the beautiful Heritage, what is that called? The it's our, our main gallery, the, yeah, the, our the main, main auction gallery. gallery yep. And it's really fun. Uh, I will be there. Also, the mighty Steve Arnold one of the world's greatest meteorite hunters, my, my brilliant co-host on Meteorite Men, will also be there. So it's a rare Meteorite Men reunion. And there's no cost to attend. You're very no. welcome. Just ask that you register at the door. And we have two wonderful auctioneers. And it, it really is a fun experience. Yeah. And you can see the meteorites in person. Yeah, in the, the previews, the previews up today and tomorrow and a little bit before yes. the auction as well. All right, thank you. I think uh, over and out. Thanks for watching.